On uh, reproductive rights issues, uh, our panelists on this panel are constitutional law scholars from a range of schools in both senses of the word, uh, and I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Uh, Michael Sto and, and, and I'll give them in batting order. So this will be the order in which, in which they speak. But unlike a baseball game, which lasts as long as you can keep hitting the ball, uh, I'm going to be brutal with them. And each of them is going to speak for 15 minutes before we have a discussion uh, among the members of the panel. Uh, leading off um, and playing far right field uh, is Michael Stokes Paulson, who is a, a distinguished university chair at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Uh, after him uh, will be Larry Solom, who's the John Carroll Research Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center, and also the, um, I don't know exactly what the noun is, but the progenitor, the runner of the incredibly influential legal theory blog. Uh, after him will be Jamal Green, who is a professor of law at Columbia Law School, and finally, and hitting cleanup, uh, David Strauss, who's the Gerald Ratner Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. We're going to have a wide-ranging discussion. Uh, and in thinking about these issues, um, I just want to make a couple of uh, opening remarks about thinking about Roe's influence on jurisprudence more generally as a series of concentric circles. Uh, there are some issues that are closely tied to reproductive rights on which Roe has had some influence. Uh, there are some issues that are much more far afield. Um, and uh, an observation for you that in David Lodge's wonderful academic novel, Small World, there's a character, Perce McGarrigal, who can't stand uh, pretentious academic talk. And he's at a cocktail party, and somebody says to him, what is your dissertation about? Uh, and he says, my dissertation is on T.S. Eliot's influence on Shakespeare. Uh, and somebody says to him, no, no, don't you mean Shakespeare's influence on T.S. Eliot? And he says, no, uh, the other way around. And in fact, if you think about it, uh, T.S. Eliot himself actually wrote along these lines that the past should be altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. And so we might think in today's discussion about the extent to which our understanding of Roe has been inflected uh, by the cases that come after it as much as Roe has influenced those cases. Uh, so with that as an introduction, Michael. Oh, thank you, Pam. It's um, great to be here back home at Stanford Law School, omitted from the standard um, resume, uh, is the fact that I'm, I'm a Stanford Law School student dropout. And that, that's how you get to Yale Law School, is you drop out of Stanford. That's where I met Pam. It also thanks to uh, Mike McConnell, a long-standing friend. Um, first met Mike in the Solicitor General's office when I was a summer law clerk in the summer of 1984, and we've been uh, good friends ever since then. I'm going to start by fighting the panel topic just, just a little bit. I have a green outline you can follow. Um, but the, the panel is framed as posing this question, how has Roe affected constitutional jurisprudence, both doctrine and theory, beyond reproductive rights issues? And I think that's a bit like asking, you know, how, how did John Wilkes Booth affect American theater performances? other than my American cousin, right? You know, it's an interesting question. It's something you can talk about, but it's not really the main point, right? It's not the big deal. It's sort of like asking, what, you know, what was the effect of Hiroshima on gardening practices in Japan? Well, there was fallout, to be sure, but that's not the main point. And that's kind of the way in which I'd press back just a little bit at the panel topic, is that Roe is the big kahuna. It's the big deal, right? Uh, we don't really care about Roe versus Wade because of its development of standing doctrine, mootness doctrine, its impact on the unaddressed issue of younger Dombrowski abstention, or even personal jurisdiction. Right? We might care a little bit more about its ripple effects on other substantive due process issues, family law, right to die, some people will get all hot and bothered about punitive damages. But again, that's not what Roe is significant for. Roe's significance for constitutional jurisprudence is that Roe created a new substantive individual liberty to kill living human fetuses. I mean, it created a substantive right of certain human beings to kill 
other human beings, other human life forms. And that's what it's about, right? That's the big deal. Um, Roe is kind of an atomic bomb in constitutional jurisprudence. To be sure, it has had fallout for other areas of law, but in the end, Roe is not really so much relevant for its impact on jurisprudence in other respects. Roe's relevance is because of its holding and the methodological consequences of Roe are significant precisely because of abortion. It's really all about abortion. So in terms of the practical constitutional and human consequences, um, I think Roe is easily one of the four or five most significant Supreme Court constitutional decisions of all time. I'd rank it up there with McCulloch versus Maryland, a very formative decision. Dred Scott versus Sanford, probably the highest impact constitutional decision of the Supreme Court of all time. Nothing in the modern era rivals it with the possible exception of Brown versus Board of Education. In part because Roe's human stakes and constitutional stakes are just so absolutely enormous. And, and that's true no matter which view you have on it. You know, Pam Carlin's view on it is different from mine. From one perspective, Roe is hugely significant because, as conceptualized, it involves the lives of literally every American woman, right? The life, the freedom, the autonomy of every woman without the abortion right, the theory of Roe is, uh, and, and subsequent decisions, that women uh, cannot live the lives they wish unencumbered by the specter of pregnancy uh, childbirth and parenthood. And Roe is, in that sense, for women, a fundamental charter of sexual freedom, economic freedom, social freedom. Right? That's huge if you view the case this way. Viewed from the other perspective, Roe literally is a matter of life and death. Right? It literally concerns the lives, the very human existence of 60 million some American lives. Uh, if you have that view of the case, which is more my view, um, Roe unleashed an, a holocaust unparalleled in, in any other uh, 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 situation. The number of human lives, if that's the way you view the case, that are affected by Roe, the number of deaths perpetrated as a result of Roe, exceeds the sum of the Nazi holocaust, Stalin's purges, Pol Pot's killing fields, Rwandan genocide combined. Right? So on either view of the case, row stakes are just enormously important, and both views of the case cannot possibly be right, which is why people fight about it so hard. That's what's going on in the jurisprudential debate. The whole jurisprudential debate is about what happens from your legal theory in terms of the specific outcome of Roe. There are collateral consequences too, but that's really what the issue is all about. Now, turning to Roe's general jurisprudential implications uh, or importance, I have a couple of, of, of specific points. First and most obviously, um, Roe has been and continues to be really the modern paradigm case framing the constitutional debate over constitutional interpretation for the past 40 years and counting. In part, that's because of its stake. Uh, every generation, it seems, has its paradigm case, right? It's a major landmark Supreme Court case. It seems to define the jurisprudential ethos and frame the academic and judicial and scholarly debate over uh, the Constitution for its generation, for 20 years, 30 years, sometimes for much longer. Uh, McCulloch was such a case. Dred Scott was such a case. Plessy and Lochner defined their era. The New Deal revolution, the trilogy of Commerce Clause cases and West Coast Hotel defined an era. Brown defined an era. Roe versus Wade has defined this era, for most of us, our era of constitutional jurisprudence. Everything turns on, you know, what is Roe? Uh, uh, it defined the jurisprudential debate. It sort of galvanized the forces of anti-judicial activism, saying that this takes the Warren Court revolution far too far. From the other side, uh, the defense of abortion rights has sort of become the sine qua non of respectability. Roe is the altar at which every knee must bow uh, as a precondition for uh, judicial confirmation. In fact, in some ways, that's appropriate. If I were to uh, formulate a litmus test question for a potential judicial nominee that would tell, them, tell me the maximum amount 
of information about their jurisprudence for everything. I would say, what do you think of Roe versus Wade? Right? Because the answer will give you a lot of information about exactly what is important and what everybody thinks. Okay? Uh, do you believe in an open-ended constitution or do you believe in strict textualism or original meaning? Okay? Do you believe in sort of free-form judges creating, extrapolating new rights from old precedents or do you, are you more closely bound to text, tradition, etc.? cetera? Uh, what do you conceive of the judicial role to be? Is it part of the role of judges to formulate these rights or should they more defer to political choices? Uh, the question about Roe versus Wade would also frame the, uh, the issue of stare decisis, right? Uh, what do you think we should adhere to Roe, whether or not mistaken, simply because it has been decided, it's been a precedent for a while? Uh, what is your theory of precedent and stare decisis? Asking that question would also tell you a lot about potential judicial character and courage. What is their reaction to that? So in many ways, I think Roe is the defining litmus test, Rorschach block, uh, uh, test of what someone's constitutional jurisprudence is. Um, my second observation is, of course, highly contentious and controversial. And that is in terms of ju uh, Roe's jurisprudential impact, I believe Roe is perhaps the most lawless, anti-constitutional, major Supreme Court constitutional decision of all time, certainly in the past 150 years, rivaled only by Dred Scott 150 years ago, a case with which it shares much in common uh, jurisprudentially and methodologically, okay? No rule supplied by the text of the Constitution supports the result in Rome. No rule or principle derived from the text or the logic of the structure of the Constitution remotely supports the result in Rome. Rome's result cannot be fairly traced to any decision, authoritative decision of the people or any expression of the intention of the framers. In terms of traditional constitutional criteria of text, structure, and history, Roe has absolutely no support. I think its substantive due process holding is rightly regarded as something of a bad joke in, in, in elite constitutional law circles. Yet many people, of course, support the result in Roe itself, and that leads to what I think is the third significant uh, feature of Roe as a jurisprudential matter, is that Roe has been the prime driving force behind the various modern uh, May I say result-oriented interpretive methodologies or creativities that have bloomed over the past 40 years. And in that regard, I'm reminded of the way my high school chemistry lab partner and I used to do our lab experiments back home in Wausau, Wisconsin. My partner was Cal Tillish, and Cal was quite an exuberant guy. Of course, he's now a lawyer, but he had a, he had a singular method for doing lab experiments. We weren't very good at it. First, draw the desired curve. Then, plot the data. If time permits, do the experiment, right? We knew what the result was we wanted to reach. We knew what was expected in terms of the, the assignment. So we would draw the curve, plot the data, and if time permits, do the experiment. No, we, we actually did do the experiments first. And they didn't usually turn out the way we anticipated because of mammoth human error. Okay. When I look at the effects of Roe in terms of the development of modern constitutional law scholarship, I see a lot of Cal Tillich uh, draw the curve, plot the data, then do the experiment uh, methodologies. Um, and we have seen over the past 40 years increased attention to theories of unwritten constitutionalism, a theory that if you think about it, is at odds with the idea of written constitutionalism. I've seen theories of common law constitutionalism, including several sophisticated versions developed by my friend David Strauss. Um, and we've seen truly imaginative re-readings or renderings of supposedly open-ended constitutional texts like Privileges or Immunities Clause, Ninth Amendment, Equal Protection Clause, 
where the methodology seems to be to take an abstract principle, formulate it at its highest level of abstraction, supply it with the content you desire, and then read it back into the text. Um, the final significant jurisprudential development that I'll discuss is, is really interesting in its own right, and that is the resurgence of the idea of stare decisis in constitutional law. Traditionally understood as a conservative doctrine, okay, stare decisis has seen a reinvigoration in the interests of validating or entrenching the prior decision in Roe versus Wade. Um, and of course that case is Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, which reaffirms Roe not on the grounds that Roe was correct when decided, but because Roe has been decided before. Now there are two large problems with the idea of stare decisis and Casey's development of it. And as you can see by my outline, I cite myself all the time. It's focused some of my attention. The two large problems are this is first of all, the idea of stare decisis in constitutional law is largely a sham. Sometimes my first or second year law students will ask me in, in all innocence, well, when does the Supreme Court have to adhere to its prior decisions? Uh, the honest answer is the Supreme Court adheres to its prior precedents, except when it doesn't, right? Um, and Casey, you know, overrules two cases and modifies slightly its prior standard for abortion regulation, all in the name that we have to do that in the name of stare decisis. And of course, subsequent to Casey, there have been innumerable situations where the Supreme Court has overruled major constitutional decisions on the premise that, well, we think now that they are wrong. Um, I wrote an article for the North Carolina Law Review, I don't think it will earn me the same fame as uh, uh, Roy Lucas, um, but sort of snottily entitled, does the Supreme Court's current doctrine of stare decisis require adherence to the Supreme Court's current doctrine of stare decisis? And the reality is that no, the doctrine of stare decisis is manipulable and really can be used to validate essentially any result. And the Supreme Court is not consistent in its selective doctrine of stare decisis. It leads me to conclude that the rationale of stare decisis in Casey was simply a ruse, a dishonest cover for a decision reached out of political cowardice. Okay, so that's one problem with stare decisis. And if that weren't enough, the second is that stare decisis is actually wrong in principle in constitutional law. Think about it. The premise of stare decisis in constitutional law is that assuming the prior decision is wrong, okay, if the prior decision is wrong, we will adhere to it anyway simply because it was decided before. Now I think that that sort of deliberately reaching a known erroneous decision is actually contrary to the first premises of written constitutionalism and Marbury versus Madison. Marbury's syllogism, if you remember, is that where the Constitution says one thing and a faithless act of a subordinate entity says another, you always go with the Constitution and not the faithless departure from it. By that same reasoning, to knowingly adhere to a wrong, unconstitutional decision is to act unconstitutionally a second time. So as significant as the doctrine of stare decisis is or may be after Planned Parenthood versus Casey, I think it is the most dubious constitutional development, and here it is used in service of trying to entrench a decision the court would otherwise conclude is wrong. My last point, can I have 30 more seconds? You can have, oh, you can have 30 raise. seconds, but you'll be surprised what will happen at the end of the 30. I, I will raise it as a question. The seriousness of the errors in Roe raises a profound question of judicial legitimacy. Okay? And here I cite my own article on Lincoln and judicial authority. I think the crisis in judicial authority and legitimacy presented by Roe versus Wade is almost exactly parallel to that presented by Dred Scott. If you see a decision as significant, wrongly decided, seriously erroneous, and having massive human consequences, what is the obligation of political actors to obey it? We'll find that out later. Thank you very much, Larry. Great. Uh, so, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, really 
wonderful occasion. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Roe versus Wade and what I'm going to call the constitutional gestalt. So let me begin just with a little bit of theoretical apparatus. Uh, the idea of a uh, constitutional gestalt is the idea of sort of a simplifying or framing picture, very high level, through which we interpret constitutional doctrine, narratives about uh, constitutional history, uh, theory, normative theories about the Constitution, right? So the idea of a gestalt, it's a perceptual apparatus, a very simplified picture. At any given time, there may or may not be a dominant constitutional gestalt, right? Uh, an accepted way of looking at things. Uh, so uh, what I want to talk about now is going to begin with uh, the New Deal and uh, the uh, shift in the constitutional gestalt that occurred during the New Deal era. Uh, and that shift, of course, involved uh, a reorientation, a reconfiguration of the way that we viewed various pieces of law. So during this period, for example, um, uh, some cases that had been perfectly normal decisions of the Supreme Court became anti-canonical uh, Jamal Green's work on, on this idea is, of course, really important. Lochner becomes an anti-canonical case, right? And uh, other cases enter the canon, right? The trilogy of cases on Commerce Clause power, Jones and Laughlin Steel, Darby, Wickert v. Filburn, and these become canonical cases, right? So um, uh, uh, during the aftermath of the New Deal, of course, Brown v. Board uh, joins the canon, and at that point in history, we can look back to 1938 in footnote four in Caroline Products, and you get a very general, high-level, simplified picture of constitutional doctrine, right, that involves a presumption of constitutionality, high degree of deference using the rational basis test, a basically theory in, uh, princip uh, a basically Thayerian conception of the doctrine with limited exceptions for the enumerated rights in the Bill of Rights, uh, for uh, things that clog the political processes, and uh, for regulations that burden discrete and insular minorities. So that's the constitutional gestalt, the dominant picture, sort of the simplified way that we fit the doctrine together that's in need of normative justification that regulates the narratives about the history. Uh, and then we get Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965. So uh, Griswold uh, does not comfortably fit this footnote for New Deal gestalt, right? Why not? Well, the reason is very familiar, right? The right to privacy that's recognized in Griswold uh, doesn't fit any of the three footnote four exceptions. And of course, at the time, uh, there is a lot of discussion about whether or not you can reconcile Griswold uh, with the New Deal Gestalt, and in particular, whether Griswold represents sort of a revival of Lochnerianism in a different sphere, in the sphere of privacy, not in the sphere of social and economic regulation. Right? And then in 1973, Roe v. Wade comes along. And in both of these cases, the reasoning right, is seen by many as problematic. In Griswold, of course, there was a fragmentation of the reasons. The justices were all over the map in providing reasons. In Roe v. Wade, the constitutional analysis is thin. Right? A lot of work goes into how you could repair that analysis in the scholarly sphere, but in the opinion, it's thin. Roe becomes crucially important right, uh, because it cannot be cabined off in the same way that Griswold could. Griswold, there's lots of things you can say about it. You can view it as, a, as an exception, as a one-off. Uh, you can rationalize it on the basis that it's it's outcome is so widely accepted, 
right? And it is so uncontroversial for most, not for everyone, but for most Americans, uh, that it doesn't damage the gestalt. It doesn't rip a, 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 a tear in the fabric of constitutional law. But Roe v. Wade cannot be ignored in the same way. It is intensely controversial, although you know you want to note historically that the intensity of the controversy sort of comes a little bit later than the decision itself. It's the result not just of jurisprudential criticism, of which there was quite a bit, but of uh, political mobilization against the decision. That's an important part of the story. Constitutional gestalts have to resonate with politics. So what, what I would like to suggest is that Roe versus Wade results in the emergence of two competing constitutional gestalts, two different ways of organizing the big picture, right? Just focus for a moment now on the individual rights dimension. And I'd like to suggest that there are two pictures here. One I want to call the dynamic view of individual rights, the d dynamic view of unenumerated rights. This gestalt, right, assumes that Roe is canonical. It's, not, it's a canonical case. It's a foundational case, a cornerstone case, a building block case, a case upon which additional individual rights can be layered, right? And so we get, uh, uh, from this perspective, the idea that uh, subsequent cases like Lawrence v. Texas, right, following in the same tradition, are part of a dynamic story of the Supreme Court recognizing rights that are somehow justified, right? Different theories are going to be offered for these justifications. Right? The theories have to be consistent with this dynamic view. You could have a Dworkinian theory over here. You might have a recognition of the rights by a consensus of elite opinion theory over there. Right? Different theories can be offered, but they have to be consistent with this dynamic view. The alternative and competing story that emerges is one of static unenumerated constitutional rights. So, you know, at this point in history, the Gestalt has to take into account the doctrine, right? It's a Gestalt. It's a look at the facts on the ground. So at this point in history, you can't deny that Griswold has been decided, Roe has been decided. And the question is, what do we think about that? What picture can we paint Right? And so the, the, the view begins to emerge that Roe ought to be viewed as an anti-canonical case, a case that retains some core of precedential force, right? but that core is going to be eaten away at the edges by cases that limit the force of Roe, and we're not going to view Roe as a building block case. We're going to view Roe as a constitutional mistake, right? And hence, any future case that is based on, where the arguments from one side are based on Roe, right, that's suspect. So we have these two different views, and uh, 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 you can see that the static view of, in, of unenumerated rights calls also for some justifying theory, right? Some normative theory that makes sense of this idea of static rights. And there are two strategies. They might be reconciled, but there are two distinct strategies. So one strategy is the judicial restraint strategy. That is that we say that the reason unenumerated rights are static is because of the New Deal Thayerian principle that underlie footnote four, right? And so 
on this view, the reason we don't want to expand under unenumerated rights is that that would interfere with the democratic process, right? We've already heard about Henry Friendly and his draft, and that fits Henry Friendly, right? A New Deal era judge in terms of his intellectual form formation, it's no accident, I think, that that's the strategy that he chooses. And then there's another strategy, an alternative normative justification for this frozen gestalt, and that is originalism, right? So in a sense, this alternative gestalt, the alternative way of looking at these cases, right, gives rise to two very different, although potentially reconcilable, Const normative constitutional theories, supporting theories for this big picture. So uh, let me talk a little bit then about um, the ways in which these two alternative gestalts play out in other areas of constitutional doctrine. And let me begin with an example that P Michael Paulson mentioned, personal jurisdiction. Right? Now, you might think personal jurisdiction has nothing to do with Roe v. Wade. But in a decision called Burnham versus Superior Court, right, a personal jurisdiction decision, in fact, the two gestalts compete directly with Justice Scalia arguing that uh, old-fashioned in-hand service is automatically constitutionally correct because that was the understanding of due process that prevailed at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted, right? And on the other hand, you have uh, uh, other justices in the same case arguing for the international shoe fairness view of the due process clause, right? a static version of due process, a dynamic version of due process. McDonald versus City of Chicago, the gun control case, right? We're now talking about uh, the sub-issue in that case. This is about incorporation of the Second Amendment and its application to the states. So it is urged upon the court that the proper basis for incorporation of the Second Amendment has to be the privileges and, or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment, right? And this argument is made and supported, right, by originalists. And so you might have thought that it would have received a welcome from the originalist parts of the court, but Right? There's a problem with the privileges or immunities clause, which is it would open the door to an unfreezing of unenumerated individual liberties. And so Justice Scalia sort of famously uh, stomps on this theory uh, in oral argument. Final example the recent uh, litigation over same-sex marriage, right? And I just want to talk about litigation strategy here, and I hesitate to do this uh, being uh, uh, amongst this group because there are, there are people here who know much more about this than I do. Uh, but what I'd like to suggest is that there are two basic ways you can go, right? You can go uh, broad and are, embrace fully the dynamic gestalt, the understanding of continually expanding and evolving individual liberties, or you can go narrow. You can adopt a litigation strategy that's consistent with the alternative gestalt, that focuses on the narrowest possible arguments. Uh, and I think we've seen both of those strategies play out. Uh, in the context of the existing litigation. So um, does Roe v. Wade have an effect on other areas of constitutional law? Well, you know, that's a big complicated causal question. I've offered a speculative hypothesis, and the speculative hypothesis is that Roe v. Wade prompted uh, 
a split in the constitutional gestalt, right? Two very different understandings, and those two very different understandings have affected a lot. They've affected our narratives, our normative theories, and our understandings of the doctrine. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, what I have to say is going to be, I think, in large measure, quite consistent with what Larry has just said. I, I actually like uh, that Michael's, Michael's framing of Roe as being uh, so important, uh, and, and that one measure of that importance is uh, the, the fact that you, know, you can, you, you, it gives you so much information about a, 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 ju a judge or a judicial nominee. And I actually, that prompted me to think of, of something relevant to what I have to say, which is that uh, in Chief Justice Roberts' nomination hearing, the, uh, he, he said famously he's not going to uh, talk about whether he thinks cases are rightly or wrongly decided, and of course he, didn't, he did not say that about Roe, but there, there are actually four cases that he d did say that about. He, he actually said uh, that Dred Scott was wrongly decided, uh, he said Plessy was wrongly decided, he said Lochner was wrongly decided, and he said Korematsu was wrongly decided. Uh, and that's actually, as, as Larry has alluded to, I've written about this a little bit, that those cases are, uh, are what I think of as the American uh, constitutional anti-canon. And what I want to talk about a bit is actually the relationship between Roe and that anti-canon. In the spirit of uh, Pam's quip about T.S. Eliot and Shakespeare, I actually think that uh, Roe uh, has quite a lot to do with uh, the definition of those particular cases as being anti-canonical. So, um, given the centrality of, uh, of anti-canonicity to the way in which we uh, perform American constitutional argument, uh, uh, I think Roe, through that mechanism, is, is quite central um, to the structure of American constitutional argument. So uh, what do I mean by that? So, uh, so we're, we're talking Lochner, Dred Scott, uh, Plessy, Korematsu, I'm going to bracket, actually, because I think the, it's a much more complicated uh, case, um, but I, I, I want to make the case first that these are the only three decisions that are anti-canonical on a particular definition of anti-canonicity. I think a broader, maybe somewhat thinner definition of anti-canonicity, you could, you could include Roe itself, and uh, I think that there's some argument for that. Uh, but uh, what I mean when I say uh, anti-canonical is that uh, cases, are, uh, cases that are not only shared reference points for sort of what counts as wrong in constitutional law, but cases that are used in such a way that uh, their use is premised on their wrongness, right? So th the only reason why we talk about Dred Scott or talk about Lochner uh, or talk about uh, Plessy, um, at least in judicial opinions, and we can uh, we could say more about how they're discussed outside of, the, of, of those opinions, but the only reason we mention them is because we're making an argument that's, that's right, premised on their wrongness. We're going to say that something else is wrong um, by comparison to these uh, to these cases. And I, uh, so but what I want to say is that I, I think that, uh, that Roe is actually a quite uh, important in giving the cases those status, that, that status. And, uh, and uh, in order to make that case, I think uh, you, you first have to sort of understand how cases become uh, anti-canonical, at least in the way in which I've described it. Uh, they don't become anti-canonical because they are uh, reasoned in a particular way, at least not at the time at which they issue. Um, they become anti-canonical because of the way in which uh, they're used, right, in later cases, right? And so uh, when we look at these cases, you look at Dred Scott, you look at Plessy, you look at uh, Lochner, um, these are the, really the only cases um, that are still cited in modern constitutional law decisions that are universally, at least within the universe of those decisions, um, uh, uh, believed to be wrongly decided. Uh, uh, they're still uh, taught in uh, modern constitutional law classes, even though they're repudiated, even though they're wrongly decided. Um, there aren't a lot of cases that, um, that fit that uh, criteria. Uh, so now what does this all have to do with Roe? Uh, I, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the, what makes something anti-canonical is the way in which it's used by modern interpreters, right? So. Uh, Cases that have transparently bad reasoning uh, actually don't end up being used as anti-canonical cases because they're not, they don't have an opportunity for use by someone 
about their opponent in a, in a modern argument, right? So um, you're not going to replicate a transparently bad argument. You do replicate arguments from originalism, arguments from substantive due process, arguments from uh, a certain kind of formalism, the kinds of things that we actually see in uh, cases like Plessy, cases like Lochner, cases like uh, Dred Scott. Uh, so just to take each of them in turn, uh, Dred Scott versus Sanford, uh, hasn't always been thought of uh, in exactly the terms in which we think of it today. Uh, obviously, it was uh, uh, heavily disfavored by uh, large numbers of Americans from the moment it was decided. Uh, obviously, it was the uh, premise for the 14th Amendment. So uh, there's no question that Dred Scott has long been reviled, at least by a large uh, portion of the population. Uh, but it's also the case that Dred Scott uh, was positively cited um, in the Supreme Court um, as, as late as 1907. It was um, cited in the Insular cases less than 50 years after uh, Dred Scott was, or a little bit less than 50 years after Dred Scott was decided, uh, as positive authority for, uh, I don't need to get into the particular proposition, but it's cited as positive authority well past the time at which it's actually decided, well past the Civil War, and actually doesn't start getting negatively cited uh, until the 1960s and 1970s. Now, why does he get negative? He's cited in the 1960s and 1970s. Well, that's a, a complicated story, and it's a story that's historically contingent and historically sensitive, and has to do, I think, with uh, uh, the, 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 the process by which a case has become anti-canonical is a process of kind of uh, uh, re-evaluation, right, historically sensitive re-evaluation, a kind of repetition that just... Uh, you, you, you repeat these cases because others have repeated them before, uh, and then a kind of reinforcement that's caused by that, uh, by that repetition. And uh, so what happens with Dred Scott is uh, in the 1960s, it, it's used by, uh, primarily by progressives as a, a symbol of, uh, of Jim Crow. Uh, and so as the civil rights movement's going on, you see progressives starting to cite Dred Scott because of its holding with respect to black citizenship, not, uh, not with respect to other holdings such as... Uh, so, Prior to the 1960s, when people talked about Dred Scott in, in judicial opinions, very often uh, uh, it was about judicial activism in a particular sense, judicial activism in the sense that uh, the court reached out and decided questions it, it didn't have to decide. It wasn't really, uh, the, the, the evil of the case wasn't really uh, black citizenship, and it certainly wasn't substantive due process. Uh, and so 1960s and 1970s, you start seeing it cited um, for the proposition that uh, it stands for sort of Jim Crow. And then you start seeing it cited by conservatives as well, not for that proposition so much, uh, uh, although that becomes a sort of premise of the constitutional conversation, uh, but you see it starting to be cited uh, 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 as a precursor to modern substantive due process, right? So the argument that Dred Scott is the first substantive due process case, um, which is something that, uh, that is very much part of the conversation these days, uh, is not something that you, you, you see before the, really the 19. 80s. I'm not aware of seeing that argument made before David Curry makes it in 1983, although others uh, may be aware of other instances. But Dred Scott is consistently used as a comparator to Roe by conservatives, right? And one thing that makes Marx's cases for this kind of anti-canonicity is a, a kind of insensitivity to the ideological valence of the, site, of the cider. So it's used by conservatives, used by liberals. And so Roe provided a, an important opportunity for uh, for Dred Scott's substantive due process holding to, to sort of stand in for its anti-canonicity for conservatives. Uh, what about uh, Plessy? Uh, now, Plessy and Roe on their face have very little to do with each other, although we've already seen them discussed in tandem on this very panel, right? So Plessy and, and, uh, and Roe are uh, compared um, uh, rather famously in, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, both by the, by the joint opinion and by the dissenters, now they're sparring over, of course, the issue of stare decisis, which is discussed by, uh, by Michael earlier. And that makes sense, right? It makes sense that uh, Casey's discussion, uh, that, disc that the Supreme Court's most uh, kind of self-conscious, uh, transparent discussion of stare decisis occurs in, a, in an abortion case, where it's so urgent um, to decide what to do with cases that uh, were, uh, that at least some members of the court think were are wrongly decided. Um, and wrongly decided by a differently constituted court, right? So the urgency of that discussion uh, is actually part of what keeps Plessy alive within the constitutional conversation. It's really three, st three strands, right? Plessy gets um, discussed in constitutional opinions uh, like Dred Scott because it stands for uh, Jim Crow. 
uh, but also uh, later on uh, used by conservatives as a stand-in for at least Justice Harlan's opinion and Plessy used as, uh, to make the argument uh, as to a colorblind constitution and then, uh, then used uh, as an example of where stare decisis really goes wrong. Right? And so you should not adhere to precedent. Look at Plessy. And this is a way of making an argument about Roe. That's part of what keeps Plessy alive as part of the conversation. Uh, what about Lochner? I think, uh, I think the, the ways in which Ro, uh, Roe has affected the way in which we think about Lochner, uh, I think, is somewhat more uh, obvious. Uh, but the, what, I'll, what I'll note, um, just uh, at least for now, is that Lochner, as we think of it today, um, is not, uh, as a sort of, obviously, within the academy, there are lots of views about uh, Lochner, but within judicial opinions, within confirmation hearings, um, Lochner is still the sine qua non of, of wrongness, and there's, there are reasons for that. Uh, that wasn't the case until about the 1960s. Now, there's a lot of people, a lot of people who criticized Lochner before then. It's obviously a, a, an important part of the, prog the progressive um, tradition, the sort of anti-Lochner era tradition, but that ver the very term, the Lochner era, right, doesn't really exist until the 1970s, uh, in part because Lochner was part of a long line of other cases um, that were associated with Lochner, uh, uh, Coppage versus Kansas, Adair versus United States, uh, 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 Algaier versus Louisiana, a uh, number of cases, uh, Atkins versus Children's Hospital, a number of cases that um, are kind of lumped together within the single era. Lochner kind of emerges as the one that gets focused on, I think in part, be in large part because of uh, uh, Justice Holmes's dissent in Lochner. Uh, uh, but uh, it doesn't really get used as this kind of universal symbol of wrongness until Griswold, right? And Griswold, uh, is, is what gives an opportunity for conservatives to, to cite uh, Lochner as an example of uh, judicial activism and to call out uh, uh, progressives on hypocrisy, right? So uh, there's a long-standing progressive critique of Lochner, but then after Griswold, you see conservatives start saying, well, look, what about, you know, this is exactly the same thing um, as Lochner, um, and that just gets really intensified after, after Roe versus Wade. There are a number of ways in which we, you can show that. Uh, and so, uh, the basic argument here, right, Dred Scott, Plessy, Lochner, uh, all cases that, uh, that get cited all the time in constitutional case law, I think you can make a pretty strong argument that the reason they stay alive uh, in, within, despite being repudiated um, is because of Roe versus Wade um, and the, the, the opportunity that Roe gives conservatives uh, primarily to make, uh, to make arguments about these cases. Now, I just, uh, I have about two minutes or two and a half minutes. I, right before I came, I just took a quick look at, uh, at recent or fairly recent Supreme Court cases that cite uh, either Dred Scott, Plessy, or Lochner, um, just to give a sense of uh, how central talking about these cases is to modern constitutional argument. And uh, so the, the, the list, and this is a very partial list, the healthcare cases, McDonald versus City of Chicago, which Larry mentioned, Citizens United, Boumediene versus Bush, the uh, extraterritorial habeas case, parents involved, Kilo, Lawrence v. Texas, Grutter v. Bollinger, Stenberg v. Carhartt, Alden v. Maine, Washington v. Glucksburg, Romer v. Evans, um, Florida Seminole Tribe, Adirond, Lopez, Shaw v. Reno, Casey, all mention one of these repudiated cases um, in the course of the decision. And so, uh, and you can bet that cases from this term, including the same-sex marriage cases, including Fisher v. University of Texas, are going to cite Lochner or Plessy or Dred Scott. Uh, I, and and, and ag again, I think the, the point here is that Roe actually has a lot to do with why these cases have the status that they do. I'll just say that if I were nominated, I would apply the law and uh, <laughs> not my own preferences. <laughs> David. Uh, thanks, Pam. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks very much to Michael for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, I'd like to start, our topic is the effect of Roe on subsequent constitutional law. I'd sort of like to start by turning the topic inside out and talking about the effect that ways of thinking about constitutional law, what effect that had on discussions about Roe, and then come back to this topic. And this ties into some things that my co-panelists have said. Uh, also to uh, um, uh, Judge Randolph's very interesting and thought-provoking discussion of Judge Friendly's um, a, a well-known, now well-known draft opinion. So here's what I have in mind. When, when you talk about a case involving a constitutional right, uh, you know, a common way of analyzing it is to say, okay, there are two questions. Is there a right? And if there is a right, is the state's interest strong enough to override it? So do you have a right to speak in these circumstances? Even if you do, maybe the state has a strong enough interest that your right should be overridden. In discussions about Roe against Wade, the controversy concerned that first step. 
where is the right to an abortion? Where is it in the Constitution? And not the second step, which is the state's asserted interest in fetal life and whether that overrode the road, the, that right. Um, I think that was a mistake. I think it was a mistake attributable to some very long-standing, important currents in the legal culture, currents coming out of the pre-New Deal era, where the Supreme Court struck down a lot of social welfare and regulatory laws on the ground that it interfered with freedom of contract. Those decisions were repudiated. The repudiation took the form of saying, there's no such thing in the Constitution. That right's not in the Constitution. Where do you see freedom of contract in the Constitution, Chief Justice Hughes said in West Coast Hotel. And that way of arguing was naturally carried over to the Roe versus Wade debate by people who said, look, I just don't see this right in the Constitution. As, as Jamal just said, you're doing the same thing that the pre-New Deal court did, inventing a right that's not there. Um, the, the effect of that way of thinking about things, a couple of effects. One effect was it sort of took the sex discrimination angle, which was not well developed, of course, at the time of Roe against Wade, took that out of the picture for a while. But it also submerged the discussion of the question of the moral status of fetal life and whether even if there was a right, whether that would be sufficient to override the right. Now, the thing is, it seems to me the right in Roe against Wade the right that's involved, the interests of the woman that's involved, they're pretty strong interests. They're actually a pretty good candidate for a constitutional right and really should be in anyone's book, I think. They're the right to physical integrity, to control what goes on in your body. They're the right to control the composition of your family. Those are pretty important interests. If you want hypotheticals, the hypotheticals would be something like the government decides to conduct medical experimentation by, allow, by, by allowing certain people to be infected with a pathogen that um, uh, influences their body, you know, if you want to spell it the hypothetical classroom style, you'd say affects their bodies in the same way that pregnancy does and lasts for nine months. Could the government do that just because it wanted to see what developed and would forbid people from taking drugs that would cure the condition because it just wanted to see for purposes of medical experimentation. Seems to me there's a serious argument that would be unconstitutional. Or the other hypothetical would simply be compulsory pregnancy. The government decides there are not enough of us and so every, woman, every married woman of childbearing age has to have two children or produce a doctor's note. Um, it seems to me, again, there's a, a very serious argument that everyone should understand, everyone should agree, is at least a serious question of whether that violates the Constitution. And I think a lot of us would say that's a proper case for judicial intervention. Even if it's not, the claim that that, sort of, that, that rises to the level of a constitutional right, that seems to me a very strong claim and not the sort of thing that should incur the kind of hostility um, and, and claims of lawlessness that Roe against Wade incurred. Um, but as I said, because of the Lochner era framing, the pre-New Deal era framing, which was uh, uh, the problem with what went on pre-New Deal was they made it up, it's not in the Constitution, that was the natural form of attack on Roe against Wade. And it um, uh, focused on that issue, which I think is not the real issue. The real issue, it seems to me, is what you do about the state's asserted interest, the interest in fetal life. And I, I say that was the real interest because I think that is the interest that the opponents of Roe against Wade really cared about. That's what they cared about. They didn't really care that the word abortion isn't in the Constitution or that the court was sort of finding these rights to personal integrity that are pretty good rights. That's what they cared about. They cared about the things Mike Paulson talked about, the, the, what, what they saw as the destruction of innocent human life. I also think it is the issue that supporters of Roe against Wade should have focused on. I mean, the claim, after all, was um, that, that Roe against Wade allows, and for that matter, any, any repeal of an abortion law allows for helpless, innocent beings to be killed. And if there's one thing that progressives, among whom I count myself, stand for, it is that the power of the state should prevent that from happening. Um, so it seems to me this should have been a sharp point for defenders, for both defenders and opponents of Roe against Wade to think about. Um, uh, what, what is your, in the side of the defenders of Roe against Wade, what is your answer to that claim? Uh, and it's not enough to say, it's, it's not immediately enough, and I think in the end it is enough, but it's not immediately enough to say, well, we'll leave it to the conscience of every woman. I, as I say, I think in the end that's the right answer. But at least in the first, at a, at a first cut, you don't leave it to individual conscience if what is really at stake is the loss of innocent, defenseless life. That's something that the state does not allow to be left to matters of conscience. Okay, why would this have been a more productive way, a more productive way, I think, for, for, for that reason, because I think it would have forced defenders of Roe against Wade to focus on what was really bothering the other side and to come up with some answers. As far as the opponents of Roe against Wade, I also think it would have focused their arguments in a way that would have been more um, productive. 
one thing that's always struck me, and again, this is a relic, or a relic is probably loading the dice. It's a, it's a, a, a an artifact of the pre-New Deal uh, uh, debate about constitutional law. One thing that's always struck me about the opposition to Roe against Wade is why does it take the form of saying this should have been left the democratic process? Um, it's the same point I just made about progressives. If the opposition to Roe against Wade is what Mike Paulson just said, this is the destruction of innocent human life, why are you leaving that to the democratic process? You shouldn't just be saying Roe against Wade is wrong. You should be saying there is a constitutional obligation on the part of states to forbid abortion. Forget leave it to the democratic process. If the people in some state decide to round up a bunch of innocent people and kill them, you wouldn't be saying, oh, well, that's democracy. You would be saying the federal government ought to step in and stop that. So why is it that the opponents of Roe against Wade have settled on this apparent middle ground? Um, and as again, I think this is all sort of Lochner era, pre-New Deal era backwash, that that was the discussion in pre-New Deal, that should we have these social welfare and regulatory laws, the court should stay out of the picture, there's nothing in the Constitution, leave it to democracy. I think that was the right result there, although I actually have some quarrels with that too. Um, uh, but why was that the form that the Roe debate took, except that it was a hangover from that previous era? Now, why would this have been more constructive? I think it would have been more constructive because I actually don't think there are very many uh, there's a large uh, proportion of the opponents of Roe against Wade actually think that. I don't think they actually think this is equivalent to, uh, the destru to infanticide, to killing um, uh, people with the full entitlements of human beings. I think they think it's something in between. Uh, these are entities, these are beings, the, 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 the fetuses are beings that have some level of moral entitlement, but not the moral entitlement of a full, full human being, at least in early stages of pregnancy. And I think that had Roe, the Roe debate focused on that side of the issue, the opponents of Roe would have been forced to sharpen their arguments and explain, okay, just, just what is the moral entitlement of this being? And, you know, on the other side of the scale is a pretty important right on the part of human beings and, as, as the law later developed, women to control what happens in their body and to control their destiny. So unless the moral entitlement of these beings is pretty heavy duty, you're not going to be able to overcome this right. Uh, and you should explain what, just what moral character you assign to these beings. I think the debate would have been much more constructive framed in those terms and conceivably, I mean, you, you know, conceivably um, would have been narrower and wouldn't have been as, uh, it wouldn't have uh, precipitated the kind of standoff that it's precipitated. It would have resolved itself into a, you know, a disagreement, yes, but perhaps a narrower disagreement in which the points on each side could have been recognized by the other. The magnitude of this interest to the women carrying the child and the fact that it was, uh, these were laws that affected only women. It was uh, a form, it seems to me, a form of sex discrimination, however the doctrine might treat it. Um, and the interests are very important. On the other hand, a sort of a real difficult, tough question about the moral status of the, uh, of, um, uh, of fetal life. As I say, you know, who knows whether in fact the debate would have been less contentious, but I think this is a way in which pre-existing ways of thinking about constitutional law that came to us from the, from the New Deal era, from the Henry Friendly um, uh, era, had an effect on the debate that was not good. It's no one's fault, it's just the way these things um, develop. Um, okay, so what is that, what is that? I should just, uh, one more point about this, is a, in case anyone's sort of um, had this thought. I think if you think about it this way, it does have some implications for constitutional law. I mean, I think, you know, for example, it would raise a question about whether people have a constitutional right to certain medications uh, in certain circumstances where they're, where they're faced with a uh, debilitating condition and the FDA withholds the medication. It would constitutionalize that question. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it should be. Uh, but I think that, that, that's the way these issues should be thought about. Okay, uh, as for the, the uh, sort of the effects on on the law as it's, uh, as it's developed, the legal culture as it's uh, developed. Uh, here's what I want to say about that, and it grows to some extent out of, out of what I've just said. Um, I, I think that the Roe against Wade has had a, uh, has an, a narrowing, an unfortunate narrowing effect on the way, uh, so if you can forgive me, the crude characterizations of liberals and conservatives, an unfortunate narrowing effect on the way liberals uh, think about constitutional issues there is, are, are certain, um, uh, the sort of the, the, the need to justify Roe against Wade has, I think, narrowed the debate that perhaps liberals should be having. But what I really want to focus on is the effect of Roe against Wade on conservatives. And I do that not, not to pick on conservatives, but because I think we're in an era, in an era where uh, conservative legal thinkers and conservative judges and justices are ascendant. 
Um, and what I want to say is I think Roe against Wade, while it has been a good thing for conservatives, it has been a bad thing for conservatism. Um, I think judicial conservatism, legal conservatism, uh, these days I don't, has no core. I don't know what it consists of anymore. Um, uh, it obviously doesn't consist of following precedent, one traditional understanding of judicial conservatism, because Roe against Wade is a precedent, and you don't want to follow Roe against Wade. Um, it uh, uh, it uh, doesn't consist, uh, apparently doesn't consist of uh, a belief in federalism. If you look at the decisions about gun control and affirmative action, those are anti-federalist decisions. It doesn't consist of judicial restraint, a whole series of decisions fall into that fall into the category of a, an affront to judicial restraint. It's not particularly libertarian if you think about the reaction to the war on terror. And I think what's happened is that Roe against Wade has become such a player in these debates that it has kind of, um, it has produced a kind of a us versus them um, view on the part, maybe of both sides, but what I really want to talk about is conservatives because as I say, I think they are an ascendant. Uh, ascendant. And here is I think the dynamic that uh, happen. Roe against Wade, after all, was not a particularly, was not a decision by the liberal wing of the court. Um, uh, Richard Nixon ran against the Warren Court in 1968. He then appointed four justices, three of whom joined the seven-person majority in Roe against Wade. The, the intellectual forefather of Roe against Wade was John Harlan, uh, who was, of course, the leading dissenter in the Warren Court decisions. So this was not a decision that came from sort of quote-unquote liberals. Um, uh, at the time. I think what happened is that a lot of people uh, looked at what was going on uh, and saw uh, people who, were, who found Femme Roe against Wade disagreeable, uh, or, or more than disagreeable, looked at that and said, boy, we are just closed out of this entirely. The liberals are against this, and now the conservatives have decided this abomination of a case. Um, uh, and, it, and it provided a rallying, uh, a rallying cry for a certain kind of judicial conservatism. Um, and it was an us versus them rallying cry. It was a, for too long, we have been closed out of the process. Um, first the Warren Court, and now we got rid of the Warren Court, and we got Roe against Wade by the, by the, by the uh, alleged opponents of the Warren Court. When are we going to get our time? Uh, and judicial conservatism, I think, has taken that form. They had their time. That was the time of the Warren Court, where the Warren Court is extended through Roe against Wade, even though it really wasn't a Warren Court decision. They had their time. This is our turn. We've got the power now. We're going to use it. And I think that's produced this incoherence in judicial conservatism. Uh, as I say, it's, you know, it's a, the conservatives are, for various reasons, uh, uh, in positions of, of power and uh, influence. But I think the country has been deprived of a kind of principled judicial conservatism that it could badly need. Um, I have three minutes left, but I will uh, yield them back to the chair. Well, I didn't mean to shut off debate like that. Um, so um, I thought what we might do now is I have a couple of questions that I'll throw out to you guys, and you guys can react to them and uh, react also, of course, to each other's conversations. And then we'll also have time for questions from the uh, audience as well. Um, and I think my first question kind of picks up in a way uh, on some things that uh, some things that David said, uh, and that is the extent to which the explanation for why Roe has become the flashpoint case. Um, so I think Michael has an explanation that's a coherent explanation, which is it's the worst case ever because of the effect on uh, innocent human life. And if that's what the case is about, and that's what you see about, then that explains why, why Roe, as opposed to some other case from the late Berger, early Warren court. Um, but David suggests a little bit that it's also, of course, a case about women's rights and a kind of destabilization of society that may have very little to do with fetal life, but may have an awful lot to do with changing of social roles and a feeling of threat to traditional values that are not really about uh, that are not really about the moral status of the fetus. And so I wonder um, for you all whether the change in how Roe's been looked at as a case about women's equality, um, which is thought of as being a defense in some ways of Roe, may also be an explanation of why Roe has been such a flashpoint, that Roe is seen as a threat not so much to fetal life, but to an entire set of traditional values that are about sexual behavior more generally, regardless of whether, uh, whether there's a, a fetus or not a fetus, a human life or not a human life at the end of the, at the, en at the, end of the process. So I just kind of wonder 
how you guys think about the relationship between those two different parts of it. Well, so. I'll start because it actually gives me a chance to respond a little bit to David Strauss. You know, I think the debate is, and, and the reason for the flashpoint is about the moral status of the fetus. Okay, I think that is the core of it. Uh, David formulated it, you know, he says, our usual rights conception says, you know, is there a liberty interest and then is the state's interest sufficiently weighty to overcome it? And he says, nobody looks at the latter point. Well, I'm not sure that's right. I think what drives Roe as a flashpoint is that even if you posited on some other imaginative textual theory, a liberty interest of the woman in, in not being pregnant, right? I think you would still have the question of if the fetus has a moral status as a human being, okay, does not the state's interest trump it? Is there not a compelling interest? In it? And I think that's really what it's about as opposed to questions of traditional values or anything else because it's actually, you know, this is an interesting point. There were conservatives who, quote unquote conservatives, who supported abortion rights in the 60s and 1970s in kind of a, this will sound like an oxymoron, a, a gentle eugenics approach, you know, conservatism as, you know, we need to have fewer of these poor, bad people and things like that, you know, uh, things that David Garrow mentioned about, uh, oh, oh, I think it was Judge Randolph, about population control and things like that. Um, and actually, I think the, the test question that puts, that becomes hard for those who adopt a women's rights rationale for Roe and that sort of implicates the centrality of the issue of the moral status of the fetus is what do you think of sex selection abortion? Okay, it's an issue that I've been working on. I think I dropped a reference to my article title, It's a Girl. Okay. If, the, if sex selection abortion, which, which basically is a phenomenon not hugely prevalent uh, in, in America, but prevalent enough that it does produce distorted birth ratios. Um, if sex selection abortion is wrong because it is a right to kill girls because they are girls, or will be girls, um, why is that wrong? It has to be at bottom on the basis of some view that there is a moral status to a fetus. And then I think Can I just ask you why you, why you say that? That is one, I, I, I don't have uh, uh, too much of a dog in this fight, but one could imagine that you might think it's wrong because of the message it sends not about the fetus, but the message it sends about women more generally. That is, um, it sends a message that girls should be less valued than boys, why does it independent send, right. of whether you're killing female fetuses or male fetuses. But it only sends that message if you are killing something that has a human moral status. No, the theory I, I, of the, uh, the theory of which Roe and Casey is based is that the fetus does not have a moral status that weighs certainly not in the constitutional calculus. Right, but I and, could well, imagine... Well, let me, just, let me, let me just, finish. Sure. Let me just finish. If you follow that premise to its conclusion, you're not aborting girls, it shouldn't send that message, you're aborting non-human non-entities, right? And so I, I don't know why it would communicate that message. Suppose Unless we, suppose it, but it, I'll give you a hypothetical that illustrates it, which is suppose we had a view that said after people die, we bury men with dignity and we throw women into the garbage can. It wouldn't be because we think that a dead person has a, a moral claim, They're, they've ceased to be human in any sense at that point, but it sends a message to the living that we value one kind of person more than another. It, I think it also sends that message, but the reason it sends that message is because you are treating human beings, to be sure, dead now, differently on the basis of sex. Well, but it doesn't matter whether you, whether the, you think of them as human beings or not. That is, it's ascending, it sends a message in either sense. I, I, I think it does, because I, you know, if there were some practice that we buried, we buried dead male dogs, but we cremated female dogs, I, I don't think it would have the same salience. 
the argument only has salience because there is some, at, at the intuition, everybody's intuition is that there is something wrong with sex selection abortion. Uh, Mike, 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 I actually agree okay. with you on a lot of these things, but Pam is clearly right on this. I mean, if you imagine people who defaced billboard pictures of minority group members. I'm sorry? That, if you imagine a, a, a people who defaced billboard pictures of minority group members, that would be worse than just a random act of, of vandalism, right? because of what you're saying about minority group members. It's not because the billboard has a moral status. I think Pam is right about this. Having said that, I mean, I, I understand, I mean, I'm with Pam on this, I understand your position. Um, I, I guess I, I should know this from, from, from reading your stuff, but I've just forgotten what you've said about this. Um, what is your view about whether there should be a constitutional requirement that abortion is forbidden? I'm sorry. Constitutional it requirement. Slow it down. There's a little, there the is constitutional an requirement that abortion is forbidden. The states have to forbid it. It's not up to the democratic process. I'm sorry. A constitutional. Should you have a constitution? Could you? Is does the constitution require a state to forbid abortions? Oh, I think. Or, that, to for, or right. does it? <clears throat> maybe to make it slightly sharper, forbid a state from providing public funding for abortions if the state voted to do so. No, no, push him further. He's got. It's got to be murder. States have to make it murder. Right. Whether there would be a constitutional prohibition on abortion would, I think, turn on whether the constitution actually protects unborn human fetal life as persons. If so, then I think there would be an implication that there should be constitutional prohibitions on abortion. It's funny you should mention it. I have an article coming out in about two months for a different Roe versus Wade symposium examining that issue. It's not quite agnostic on it, but what it does, it, it, it's, its provisional title is The Plausibility of Personhood. Because David's right, the, the argument you know, of whether or not the fetus was a person is something that gets very little attention politically or legally in Roe versus Wade. The court sort of dismisses that as a proposition and then moves on. But I think it's just a very interesting question. If the human fetus is not a person with constitutional rights, then it would fall to the democratic process to enact whatever laws uh, it wished with respect to abortion. But, but your view, what is your view? As to personhood, I think that the, well, the article is 60 pages. I'll, I'll give you the very Gives, short version. Did, did, did. I think the arguments from the text are ambiguous. The original understanding of person as a legal term of art dating back to Blackstone included the unborn, but there's some question about the state at which the unborn acquired legal status of personhood. Evidence of structure and intention uh, leaves the issue ambiguous. And I think the problem, you know, gun to my head, if there's a better interpretation, I think that the word person most probably should be read to embrace all members of the race, human, uh, homo sapiens. From the conception, from quickening, from when? At the point when you can identify it as a discrete individual new human life. So now, but I, but I think the when yes, is that? yes, I think that's conception bio, uh, uh, medically, biologically. I think that's that's pretty well established. But I think the question is sufficiently. It, it's it's an interesting question. This will go to to Larry's point. Does that question fall within the range of sufficient determinacy that a court would be justified in reading that as a constitutional requirement, right? within any of these series of constitutional questions, there's the issue of what level of certainty or definiteness do you need in order to declare that something is the correct interpretation as opposed to an interpretation that bears a range of meaning, in which case the answer would default to democratic choices. So I, I you know, the article is still in editing. What, what should be my conclusion? I'm, I'm glad, Michael, you said that, because I, it seemed to me that that was, that, that what you just said, which is a, which is a statement about modesty, is, is probably the, the answer on stare decisis as well, right? It's 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 that we the reason well, one of the one of many reasons why we believe in stare decisis is because we're not persuaded that we're always right um, as to the current meaning of the Constitution that you know others have already decided and there's some value in um, in deference. But I, I just wanted to follow up this conversation just to put on the table because I don't think it's been clarified in this conversation. 
that it's not clear that, it's still not clear to me what the stakes of this conversation about personhood uh, uh, are, given that we, we don't normally recognize a constitutional right to be free from private violence, um, uh, at least a judicially enforceable constitutional right. Uh, and so, uh, and so I, and, and I think one can make arguments about perhaps equal protection style arguments, but, uh, but I think it's, if we're going to think about this personhood question, I think it's important to, to have some clarity about what the stakes really are, constitutionally speaking. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I think, I think you have it exactly right. The stakes are um, if human fetal life living is a person within the meaning of the Constitution's usage of the word, then it is a category of persons that's entitled to the equal protection of the laws. And for the state to yield up a class of persons to the unrestricted private violence of others would be a denial of equal protection of the laws. And it's actually historically the core meaning of equal protection, you know, and the purpose to which the framers of the 14th Amendment were addressing themselves was the failure of state governments to provide equal protection of the laws, literal protection against private violence to the newly freed uh, uh, blacks in the South. You know, that, that it is as much a denial of basic human rights for a state to refuse to protect black slaves, former slaves, and uh, essentially give them up uh, to the private violence of others. So this, that would be the structure of the argument. It doesn't answer all the questions of, you know, what, you know, what laws would then be invalidated and where the lines would be drawn, because there may be yeah, and sufficient it's, it's interest not, yeah, in this. I think it's not at all, structure yeah. I think it's not at all clear that that's a self-executing right, but I, I think it's a little far afield. I mean, it would seem to me if you, if you ended up with an argument like that, you would create a, a new set of fissures on top of the fissures that Larry identified in the conservative movement, because if you're really going to take that view of human life and the state's obligation to protect it, you're going to have to have a welfare state of a completely different sort than most conservatives are prepared to argue for, because if you're saying that the state has an obligation to protect the fetus against all of the depredations of the pregnant woman in various ways, what do you do about the obligation to protect already born children against the effects of poverty or the effects of other private forms of misbehavior? I, I, it just seems to me that the kind of, this may be another way of going back to David's point, that the kind of revealed preference or the revealed views of conservatives on this really do seem to me to have an awful lot to do with sexuality as opposed to the fetus. Because if you're right, we shouldn't see anything like the opposition we see to same-sex marriage or to sodomy laws from the people who also are most opposed to Roe, because it's impossible to explain how either same-sex marriage laws or, so, or, or sodomy statutes have anything to do with the protection of innocent human life. I mean, I, I just don't oh, see... I, I, something, something along those lines that actually ties into the question Radhika Rao asked earlier about, um, about how other countries handle these issues. You, you could see abortion as, I mean, I, I don't like the side of the debate that says we should ignore what other countries do, but it has a point in saying that it's very, I mean, Radhika's not, she knows this, she knows this, of course, it, it's, it's dangerous to pluck out one feature of another country's legal system and to, to so argue by analogy to that because it's embedded in a larger structure. And Pam's point that if you, you know, yes, other countries have more restrictive abortion laws, they also have much more well-developed uh, welfare states, and sometimes as a matter of sort of constitutional requirement or the equivalent of constitutional requirement. Um, and this, this sort of abortion is actually a nice example of the risks of taking something like, well, it, you know, they ban hate speech, which I think is sort of something we should pay more attention to. Yes, but there are all these other things going on in their society. And I, and I think this is, this is a, a Pam's point about the, um, uh, about the welfare state. So that's the other, you know, that is a playing out of a different view about, um, about human life. And just, just, to, just to briefly go, go back to David's earlier point, which I think is, is interesting that you, say, you, you bring in the comparative aspect, because uh, one other difference is that other country, many other countries tend to take a more proportionality-style focus on, on rights protection. So lots of rights are protected, but let's spend a lot of time thinking about what the state interests are and whether they're sort of constitutionally resonant interests. Uh, and, and that's a, that's an, I mean, it's a bit much bigger question about why we do things more categorically here than in other countries. But I think one of the reasons has something to do with, uh, with, with a kind of hostility to 
judges making these kinds of judgment calls rather than sort of cate categorical um, decision making. Let, let me just what? address that 20 yeah, seconds, and then, then we've got to get people something else. Um, uh, uh, Pam, I think that's a, a very important question. Like, if you were to take seriously uh, an obligation of equal protection of fetal human life, I think it would have very important obligations, and that this is part of the core meaning of the Equal Protection Clause as we have it. Uh, the, the state has a duty to uh, protect innocent life from violence, how far that goes in terms of what affirmative rights would have. But I think we could find some common ground here in that I think that the DeShaney case and the Castle Rock cases are dubious on equal protection ground. Those are cases in which there are suits against states or state officials for basically not, you know, on notice refusing to take care and protect innocent, vulnerable children uh, or, or wife in domestic, uh, uh, women in domestic violence situations. I think those are serious and colorable uh, claims. As, as to, you know, conservatives' approach being driven by sexuality, I don't know. I, I know a lot of conservatives who are way into sex, but not into killing babies. You know, they're just, um, I, I think there are many who draw those lines. There are probably also many traditional conservatives who have traditional views on sexual morality. And there are fissures. There are differences within the conservative movement. Uh, it's not monolithic. So I want to ask one more question to the folks on the panel, and then we'll be opening it up to questions from the audience. And this question comes from a kind of relationship between Larry's point and, and, and David's point. And Larry, you identified kind of the two responses to the current constitutional gestalt as being a kind of conservative uh, approach towards originalism and an approach towards um, judicial minimalism. And David, of course, says, well, we're now in this moment of conservative ascendancy. And so one of the things that you've started to see is, especially with Roe, oddly enough, is attempts to make Roe an originalist decision and attempts to have liberal originalism. And then also uh, a judicial minimalism arguments now raised by liberals rather than conservatives. And I wonder if you might say a little bit more about that in light of, you know, David's point that we're now in a kind of conservative ascendancy, that you're now seeing the arguments that you identified as the conservative responses to Roe now being the liberal responses to the conservative ascendancy being almost identical in their form. Well, it's a, that's a big question. So uh, You can use both sides of the page if necessary. Right. So uh, I think that uh, it's um, certainly true that um, you see this um, split, right, that there is sort of a judicial restraint uh, conservatism and there's an originalist conservatism. Uh, Michael's work attempts to reconcile the two in a certain sense, right, because he sees a certain kind of restraint as a feature of original meaning. Uh, 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 and, and so does Gary Lawson. So, so they can be reconciled, but they can be very, but they also can split apart in a pretty radical way. Um, so I agree with that. Um, conservative ascendancy or cons conservative judicial ascendancy in originalism, uh, I, I think that there's, um, there's, a there's a more complicated story there. Right, so uh, I think that one reason that you might see the emergence of um, progressive originalism, right, and Jack Balkin would be the poster boy, um, is, is not really because uh, of the dom, it's not necessarily that the, the intellectual dominance of uh, conservative thought. I, I, in fact, I would say that, I at least in the academy, it's quite the opposite, right? That the, the dominant way of thinking is not originalist and not conservative. Um, it seems to me more likely that if you, want, if you want to ask sort of why is there this moment where progressive originalism might emerge, um, it, I think it, it has more to do with um, politics, and in particular sort of with the idea that we were um, in an era of um, dominant um, 
a dominant Republican regime uh, politically, this would be um, Stephen uh, Skoranek's work, right, that, that uh, the Reagan presidency represents the emergence of a new regime, and that affects, of course, who's on the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, if you are um, uh, a progressive and you start to see the emergence of a Supreme Court dominated by conservatives, then uh, restraint and constraint uh, become much more attractive. Right now, you know, predicting the future is really hard and maybe the, the Reagan regime in politics is ending, maybe it's not. Um, but I think you'd see many more uh, uh, progressives becoming sympathetic to a view like uh, Jack's uh, if, through some coincidence, uh, there are no uh, uh, appointments to the Supreme Court in Obama's second term, and then we have a run of, say, three Republican presidents so that the Supreme Court uh, sort of looks seven to two, you know, with um, Alito being the most, uh, 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 you, you know, with Alito being sort of at the edge, one edge of the court. Well, that would be a very different Supreme Court, not one where you would necessarily want as a progressive for the justices to be interpreting the individual rights provisions of the constitutions to realize their own values. Um, and I don't think that this means that constitutional theorists are unprincipled or that they adopt the theory in order to get the results they want, although there, there may be people who do that. Uh, I think that there, I, I, I'm glad you turned that way when you said that. I'll be watching all of this from Canada, of course. There may be people who do that, but I think that you, you know, the theories that you, you recognize the power of arguments more readily when the consequences of the arguments are congenial. And so I just think that that's, that's the way humans are. You, if, if a position, you suddenly see that a position can be used in a way that you find congenial, then you start paying attention to the arguments that you might have just shut off uh, uh, earlier. So I think it's very complicated. I mean, that, those are inadequate remarks. I think it's very complicated. David, did you yeah, just one paragraph on this. I think careful uh, intellectual history, if that's what we mean by originalism, the kind of which Michael McConnell is a master and my co-panelists, uh, that Larry and, and Mike do, Jamal doesn't, Jamal's, I'm not in that camp, and, and other people do. I think judges have um, neither the time nor, more importantly, the incentives to do that kind of work, and often they don't have the capacity either. And I think when originalism makes its appearance, in judges, I think what's going on is it's basically a radical's position. I think originalism is the position you take when you don't like the tradition you've grown up in. I think that was what Justice Black was doing. He grew up in the Lochner tradition, the pre-New Deal tradition. He wanted to overthrow it. How do you, and a racist tradition in the South where he was from, how do you overthrow it? You do what Martin Luther did. You go back to the original texts and use the original texts against the corrupt tradition. I think that's what Black was doing. I think that's what the Justice Scalia generation of Supreme Court justices is doing against what they saw as a corrupt Warren Court tradition. And I think now you're seeing liberals do it because the tradition has become so conservative. If you look at the more recent conservative appointees to the Supreme Court, they're not originalists. Uh, they don't have to be. Um, uh, they, you know, they grew up in a conservative tradition. They're happy to keep it, uh, keep it going forward. I think that's, the that's what's going on with the rhetoric of originalism. I don't mean that at all to cast aspersions, as I said, on the careful work that lots of people do. But I think when you see it in the public domain, that's what's going on. Okay, well, now we're going to take uh, questions and comments from the off audience. Radico, you had a question. Then. So to bring some co comparative constitutional law back into the question. Um, Professor Paulson, you suggest that the fetus should be treated as a person and that the government should have an affirmative constitutional obligation to protect the lives of fetuses. Well, in fact, West Germany, under the West German Basic Law, took precisely this approach and said that the, the West German Constitutional Court held that the fetus is a person 
and that the government has an affirmative constitutional obligation to protect the lives of fetuses. Yet, it held that abortion may still be prote protected and permitted up until you know, approximately the first trimester of pregnancy on the rationale that the state need not criminalize abortion, it can adopt other effective measures such as counseling and information requirements to help persuade women, but it, ultimately the choice should be left up to the woman. So it seems to me that even if the court held, or even if a court held, that the fetus is a person and that the government has an affirmative obligation, both of which run quite contrary to the tenet of American law, it's still not clear that abortion must be criminalized. That's first. Second, you suggest as an equal protection matter that for the state to yield fetuses up to the um, to private violence by women when it does so for no other class of persons would violate equal protection. And the interesting thing about this argument is it seems to me to mirror precisely the equal protection argument for women. Um, the idea is that for the state to require women alone as a class to bear the burdens of pregnancy and childbirth, invasive physical burdens that it imposes upon no other class of persons in our society and force women to donate their bodies and their lives, even to save the life of another person would violate the equal protection rights and status of women by singling them out to bear burdens that no others in our society are forced to undergo. Parents are not required to donate a kidney or an organ to save the life of their dying child. Not even bone marrow, which is replenishable, not even blood. So to impose this burden uniquely upon women really seems to undermine their equal stature in society? A uh, couple of great questions, great points. Um, I'm familiar with the West German constitutional decision. I thought they'd actually retreated further from that and sort of not with, and, and in, in some sort of more recent decision, uh, embraced more abortion rights. Maybe, maybe you're describing the combination of the two. Um, I've read the West German opinion, but gosh, I've read it in an English translation, and even that is sort of inscrutable to me. And you know, the simple point is that there, there may be some interesting parallels, and perhaps you can learn from other countries' jurisprudence, but we're interpreting different constitutional provisions. So ultimately, the meaning of the US Constitution is the meaning of its words in context, the original public meaning the words would have had to inform speakers and readers of the English language at the time. On the question of whether that, you know, what that yields But I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that the conclusion isn't compelled. The premise well, that a yeah, fetus I, I could was, be a person and that, that, that the government yeah. has an ob obligation does still not necessarily mean that Roe was wrong. I, I think that's exactly right. If you conclude that the fetus is a person and entitled to the equal protection of the laws, that does not answer all questions as to whether there might not be countervailing interests in certain circumstances that dictate different results. I would, you know, I, I, I've sort of been speculating on that and working that through. Uh, you know, I think what it is is you would have various, you know, there's some circumstances where we permit individuals legally to take the life of another. I mean, the classic illustration is self-defense. And so what would be involved, I would think, would be judicial reasoning, if this were an appropriate interpretation of the Constitution, judicial reasoning as to what types of claims of defense would permit you to take the life of another under what circumstances. And gosh, I'm not ready to hazard a guess as to exactly where that line is. But if you frame second, it differently as not taking the life of another, but as actually imposing burdens and obligations upon women to save the life of another, it runs completely contrary to the tenets of American law and individualism to impose these obligations only upon women. Well, yes and no. I mean, we, the law does impose affirmative obligations on individuals to take care of the rights of others. It imposes obligations on parents of various forms. So there are some circumstances in which the law does impose affirmative obligations on individuals and impose some sort of uh, deprivation of liberty on them. 
But can I, can I address your second question too? Um, you know, right, the classic way in which the equal protection argument is typically invoked in abortion disputes, and this is Ruth Bader Ginsburg's contribution, Sylvia Law, a number of other people, uh, I, think, I think Pam, you, you may even be, be in on this, is the idea that abortion restrictions constitute a species of sex discrimination. Well, I think that argument has some superficial appeal, but there's some problems with it First of all, doctrinally, and then, then I think more deeply. Doctrinally, uh, classification, abortion restrictions are not classifications based on sex. They do not regulate women because they are women. They regulate the commission of abortions on the theory that we're protecting fetal life, and it regulates the conduct of men and women with respect to that. Uh, you know, it's so you know, obviously it has a more of an impact in terms of who bears the burdens of pregnancy, childbirth, and to some extent parenthood, and to some extent those burdens are socially constructed, and to some extent they're biologically constructed. G going back to David Strauss's point is that even if you found on equal protection grounds that there was some plausible basis for thinking that abortion restrictions are, are uh, sex-based classifications, that would still mean the state just has to have an important or uh, you know, truly substantial justification for imposing that restriction. And that gets you to the moral status of the fetus, right? If you accept that, then you know, protecting innocent human life from destruction might be regarded as a substantial enough basis to justify what, what is, to some extent, a restriction on, on a liberty. Linda, did you wanna? I know Linda had a question, and then Will after Linda. I just wanted to probe uh, Professor Paulson's test question a little bit. I, I and, get all the questions. <laughs> and, uh, and, and take it back. So, so this question of sex selection and abortion, uh, which as you note is not a very common practice in the United States, but perhaps a more common practice in connection with in vitro fertilization. Interesting. So you have, you have uh, a number of fertilized eggs that could be implanted, so suppose uh, so a, a couple who would rather have a daughter than a son, or vice versa, would select uh, which of the seven or eight eggs, you know, fertilized eggs would be implanted. So I think your answer to, would, to, would, would that choice have the same moral weight in your view as sex selection of a fetus? And I think your answer would maybe illuminate your personhood definition that you seem to be struggling to, uh, to uh, extract from your 60-page article. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I think that's an you know, interesting question, and it's, you know, next on the horizon. I mean, one interesting way of framing that is, you know, could the government, in the name of enforcing prohibitions on sex discrimination, forbid such a practice? Would it, in so doing, uh, be implementing the idea of equal protection and saying, no, you can't implant a boy because a boy and destroy a girl because a girl? I think in many cases, the, to, to a large extent, my intuition is that the problems, the situations would be exactly parallel if you're talking about a fertilized, conceived egg, you know, that's probably, you know, uh, biologically, that's when distinct personhood uh, uh, takes place. But that actually leads me to, to one of David Strauss's other points, is he says people don't actually buy this intuition of personhood. And I think to some extent that's true and to some extent it isn't. I think that the widespread practice of in vitro fertilization has probably caused people to like, whoa, it cannot possibly be that this is an individual human life because if it is, we're discarding and destroying them by the dozens. And, and I think it's the intuition that, you know, no, no, we can't go there, that really is a species of my high school chemistry lab experiment, right? You know, that can't be right, 
therefore the analysis must go a certain way. It doesn't, it couldn't it go in either direction? It seems to me that it's, that it might be exactly the opposite, which people look and they say, you know, you fertilize 19 eggs and you decide to implant four. We don't think of the other 15 as human beings. Therefore, how can we think of um, uh, 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 an egg that's fertilized through sexual intercourse as a human being either. Oh, I, I, that's exactly I mean, right. I, I, I think so I'm not sure that it's, that they start by saying, oh my God, we can't treat this as a human being because of the consequences elsewhere, rather than this doesn't look like a human being to us, therefore how do we say it's a human being in the, in, in I actually think it's exactly as you say, that for many you know, assisted reproductive technologies have formed the baseline of their moral intuitions, given that this cannot be a person, because if it were, I'm destroying it, okay? Therefore, the same should extend to abortion. Now, the other thing that's going on is people don't think seriously about these issues, right? You know, uh, academics do at legal conferences, moral theorists do, but I think people are not rigorous and consistent in their views of, of these different things, which is, which is an altogether different phenomenon. Well, so, so my question is not necessarily for Mike, could be for anybody, which is, what do you think the effect of Roe on the judicial confirmation and nomination process has been? And in particular, do you think it's easier or harder to get originalists or maybe sort of faint-hearted originalist judges on the bench because of Roe. You can imagine it's harder because the threat to Roe means there's opposition to people who are really outspoken originalists. You can imagine it's easier because the possibility of demolishing Roe is what makes people excited about nominating originalists on the other side. And I just wonder if any of you have thoughts about that. Can I go back to something Larry said, which I think answers this a little bit, which he said just in passing, which is remember, you said during your talk, nobody pays much attention to Griswold, everybody just kind of blew past it, right? Um, you were the person it who wasn't, I think so. it, Griswold did not yeah, it spark it, the controversy. Right. I think it's Griswold that explains our current judicial nomination process and not Roe. And the reason I think that is because I think the current judicial nomination process is completely a reaction to the hearings on Robert Bork, which were not hearings that focused on Roe. They were hearings that focused on Griswold because of his article in the Indiana Law Journal that compared the, cu the, pre the, the couple that wanted to have contraceptive sex to a factory that wanted to spew pollution into the, into the water. You'll remember there was this kind of, there's this kind of, for those of you who haven't read the Robert Bork article, there's what I think of as one of those calling Dr. Freud moments in the article, which is where he talks about the two kinds of gratification you might have is uh, a married couple having sex or a factory spewing pollution into a stream. And of course, from my perspective, the instant thing you think is calling Dr. Freud, calling Dr. Freud. We have some latent content here. Um, but that is what accounts for our current judicial hearings confirmation process, is everybody's reaction to the Robert Bork hearings, which is, I think, the message that people came away from the hearings, which were, in one sense, an extraordinary moment. They're the last time we actually had a really strong constitutional conversation at a nomination hearing. And the message everybody's taken away from that is say nothing. Right? That the most important case for a judicial nominee is Miranda. You should exercise your right to remain silent because anything you say can incriminate you. And so I think that, much more than Roe, is the case that has affected the judicial nominations process. That being said, of course, no nominee will now say anything about what he or she thinks of Roe itself. And so they use signal words, right? And so I believe in originalism as a way of saying not, I believe in originalism and I've read Jack Balkan and I'm convinced that Roe is correctly decided so I'm prepared to uphold it, right? I believe in originalism as a way of saying to people uh, on the conservative side, I'm not going to extend Roe and indeed I might not, I, I might even vote to overrule it. But I don't know if other people have a different reaction to I, 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 I don't know whether this is different or not, but, but I would say that understanding the confirmation process requires an institutional understanding, right, of the way that the Senate works. So it's just crucially important that um, there can be a filibuster Right of a nominee, so you you that means uh, 
that um, uh, people who are confirmed can't say things that publicly are unacceptable to uh, 41 members of the Senate, right? So uh, that explains why uh, everyone has to affirm a certain set of canonical cases and reject a certain set of anti-canonical cases, right? Because that's the, that's the common ground, right? And it also explains why a whole set of topics post-Bork are evaded. Right, because no matter which way you go on certain issues, there are 41 senators who would object. Right, and Roe v. Wade is one of those. Roe v. Wade is a case where there are clearly 41 senators who are going to be highly motivated to block an anti-Roe v. Wade justice, potential justice, and there are also 41, at least 41 senators who uh, uh, will take, who, who have the opposite position. So it's something that you have to evade. How do you explain Ginsburg? Yeah. Three votes against her. She said, I vote correct. Yeah, there, there's an asymmetry. Democratic candidates profess their allegiance, throw against the way Republican nominees evade it. There's an asymmetry. <clears throat> Yeah, let me just weigh in real, really quickly. I, I think you're wrong, Pam. I, I don't think that it's Griswold that's the issue. I think it's Roe that's the issue, and Griswold is the stalking horse, right? If you're going to, uh, you know, get score political points against a conservative nominee, you don't want to wage that fight so much on Roe. But if you can get them to say they think Griswold is wrongly decided, they're toast, right? Just politically, even if that's the right answer. And if you get them to say Griswold is correct, you can sort of nudge them. And so you are embracing a general general right to privacy, and you, you Anthony kennedy eyes them, right, and you neutralize them. So, but clearly, Roe has been the dominant issue affecting uh, nominations, confirmations of Supreme Court justices, at least since the, uh, the early 1980s. Sometimes the politics play out differently with respect to different uh, nominees, the circumstances of presidential uh, you know, the president's having control of the Senate or not makes an enormous difference. You get Scalia through 99 nothing because it's 1986 and you d still have a Republican Senate and Bork gets attacked in 1987 because, hey, we have the votes to defeat him. Then you have a pattern of, oh, let's look for stealth candidates or it might be the political interest of an administration to nominate someone who is not on record because they just do not wish this political fight. So there, there, there are a wide variety of approaches to it, um, but, but I think it's Roe that's the driving force, much more so than Griswold. Just, oh, oh. I was just going to add two very short cents, which is maybe it's a, a boring answer. It's a version of, of Larry's answer, which is that the, 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 the lack of, uh, of forthrightness in confirmation hearings is, is, uh, is kind of, it's sort of overdetermined. So there's no, there's no way in which we can say um, whether it's Roe or something else, uh, since there are so many other things that they don't talk about um, at confirmation hearings, and we have a very small data set. Um, to, to, so the Ginsburg point is, well, maybe that was just Ginsburg, right? I mean, who knows? I mean, the last four nominees have basically said approximately the same thing, um, and then, but then the politics gets spun in whatever way is necessary for the politics to work out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the level of polarization in politics, say you're never going to see another 98 to nothing confirmation of a, of a justice. I don't think there's anyone in the country who could get confirmed 98 to nothing now, or 94 to three, whatever it was for Justice Ginsburg. How about Michael McConnell? No, the, the, absolutely the not. Test cases. There's, there's no chance that he would be confirmed 98 to nothing, zero. But just, but I, I would just. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. Uh, 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 Jerry's point is, is well taken. Uh, but the test cases are the ones in which uh, the, the configuration of the court is such that the nominee would swing the vote, or it looks like, given the next vacancy, they would swing the vote. So, uh, uh, you know, standard, in, uh, standard sort of pivotal politics models of how the, the Senate behaves um, suggest that it's very important sort of what the status quo is and then what the nomination means uh, to the court. So um, uh, it's a very different situation when uh, a Democratic president is nominating 
a replacement for a, uh, a retiring Democratic justice, as was the case with Ginsburg, than it is when it will alter the balance of power on the court. So I just, this, just a qualification to a point which is obviously correct. I'm just going to ask a historical question about the Roe court itself and what they thought they were doing because I mean, it seems to me Larry makes a good point that uh, that it wasn't following the gestalt as of 1973 and the opinion seems so non-theoretical it has no theoretical apparatus of any you know of any sophistication in it uh, and some from what we seem to know from the uh, from the papers, they, they were all interested in the policy of abortion and not at all interested in uh, constitutional theory. So I'm just sort of wondering, what, what were they thinking theoretically? They just didn't think it was a big deal. It was, you know, that, that was the era of George W. Bush and, plan, you know, George H. W. Bush's parents and Planned Parenthood, and this was just not a, this was not the controversial issue. Um, that it became later. That's why it was seven to two with the Republicans joining the Democrats. They just didn't think of it that way. Well, the theoretical apparatus here was the liberty interest in the due process clause was broad enough to uh, encompass a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy, and this was a medical decision, and this was an era of trust in expertise. I, I find that I, it, it's that's possible, right? I, it, it's a possible explanation. I find it, um, uh, I find it uh, unlikely because I don't think that the Supreme Court um, sees itself as able to just do anything that's not controversial uh, among a certain group of elites, it, it, you, 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 at least not as a general rule. So what, what's going on here? Um, I think that there, part of what's going on has to do with, with the, the fact that there was no, there was pushback, of course, but, but it, it, it was, feeble compared to what it would be now and uh, what it might have been at other times in American history. So I think that, 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 you, that you, you really need more than that. I think that the, in this case, something has, some part of this has to do with just the contingent political dynamic within the court itself at that moment in history. It just was a time when uh, sort of the Brennan-Douglas axis on the court had been extraordinarily successful in, um, uh, uh, in mobilizing uh, 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 internal resources on the court uh, to get to certain results. And, 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 and it, it, you know, how that, that period in the court's history, you know, sort of has a, a, a lifespan, it starts, and it ends, right? And if, if, if Roe v. Wade had come out, had, had been decided before that era or after that era, it, it, it would have been written differently. It would have provoked a different reaction. So I, 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 I don't think that it's really all just elite opinion accepted the result at the time, although that clearly no, I just is mean that elite opinion thought that this was part of a, a liberty interest and that doctors and women ought to be making these choices rather than the state. I, I mean, I, Linda Greenhouse is the world's authority on this. We haven't had Marshall yeah, McLuhan my, here with us. My, my impression is that they thought they had, they had the debate in Griswold, and this was a follow-on to, to, uh, to that. And, you know, we settled this in Griswold. And, you know, that's also kind of a Lochner thing. Oh, we, we, okay, we, you know, we had it out. Black told us we were Lochnering. He lost. Um, that's established, but I mean, this is. Well, we also just can't. Want, I mean, we just can't. We can't forget the diff, the very. I mean, we've. It's very, when there's a, when there's a constitutional right uh, to abortion, uh, it's very easy to see the tragic consequences on the on the side of fetal life. Uh, but uh, when there's no constitutional right, it's much easier to see the tragic consequences for women. And we're in a very different context in 1973 um, and 72, in which it. it the, those consequences were very front and center uh, within, uh, within, within American politics. Yeah. You, you, I, am, 
apologize <clears throat> not being able to follow the legal uh, positions that are being presented, but as a physician, I am very strongly worried about the legal profession stepping in the way of communication between the physician and the patient. A woman comes, she's not clear if she's pregnant, isn't pregnant, she doesn't know what her options are, the physician, I feel, should be able to discuss reproductive options. And if those include medical abortion, is this really what Roe versus Wade is all about? Are we now defining that the fetus is viable when it's, as was brought up before, fertilized ovum that could be implanted in somebody's uterus, and there are women who are dying to have Einstein's child, and yet Einstein is paid for these uh, fertilized eggs to be held in a freezer. Uh, is, are, are we getting the legal profession in the way of what has been up till now a patient-physician interaction? So I'm sorry if that's <laughs> not a clear question, but well, I am here let, let, because I, of my concern about how medicine can or cannot be practiced. Let me, let me give a brief answer that might also offer an answer to uh, Michael McConnell's question. Um, I think the animating spirit of the Roe versus Wade decision and what they're thinking about at the time is doctors' rights. You know, you, you see that, you know, the, the, the way the opinion is written is Harry Blackman wishing to vindicate the discretion of the medical uh, 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 profession. Um, <clears throat> jurisprudentially, you might add that, you know, at, at the time, in the 1970s, early 1970s, there are so, there's so many other uh, Supreme Court opinions that seem to reflect their sense of the time that what we do here is make social policy in the name of Constitution. You know, you, you go back and you read Roe versus Wade from the perspective of 40 years later and it feels just a little bit alien, but then you remember, oh yeah, this is lava lamps and bell bottoms and long sideburns. They just sort of have a different way of conceiving. What they do is an entirely different style uh, of jurisprudence that was not what we recognize as textual analysis, a lot of careful attention to precedent and doctrine. It was more, uh, you know, this is what we think the correct social policy is and we're balancing the interests this particular way. I think just to answer your question more, di more directly, there's always this question of the relationship between legal regulation and a doctor's relationship to her patients. Um, it's true with respect to abortion, but it's true with respect to a number of other issues as well. And so the question is one about uh, deciding what the underlying right of the patient is and then deciding whether you can compel a physician or forbid a physician from giving certain kinds of advice. And that's true with respect to abortion. It's true with respect to a number of other areas of law as well. You know, the, the ones that are, I think, probably the most high salience ones today are things like doctor-assisted suicide uh, and, uh, and, and abortion, but there are, have been other periods of time where there are other examples of that as well. And so one of the places where you do see in contemporary law a lot of arguments about abortion rights and, and physicians' um, ability to practice uh, their profession are things like the South Dakota Informed Consent Statute, which goes to what does a doctor have to say in uh, obtaining informed consent from a patient who wants to terminate a pregnancy? Um, you know, are doctors required to perform certain kinds of tests beforehand? Are doctors required, for example, to perform ultrasounds and to show the woman the, the, the results of the ultrasound? Are they required to tell a, uh, 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 women, as the South, Car South Dakota statute has it, that there are the following consequences from abortion, whether or not the doctor believes those consequences are in fact something that the, uh, that the patient's likely to encounter. And that raises not just the rights of the patient, but of course also raises the rights of the doctor, in particular the doctor's First Amendment 
free speech rights. So you're going to see those issues come up uh, uh, in, in modern times as well as at, at the time of Roe itself. I, I like your comments and want to point out that something like 30% of women who believe they are pregnant experience spontaneous abortions so that if and when a woman is receiving services, you know, I don't think there is the need to put her through the additional harassment of uh, prove that you were truly pregnant in order to have somebody else the next day possibly when a spontaneous abortion could have again occurred, um, proof that you are carrying a viable conception or an act of. Well, we've come to the end of uh, this panel, so thank you all very much.